Short-term disability creates long-term stability. You do what is right even when it's difficult, and even though it hurts in the moment, you reap what you sow. The fruit will come later. Look, when you're digging the hole in the ground to plant the tree and you're laboring in the sun to water the tree and fertilize the tree, don't expect apples on the fruit tree yet. It might take a few years. You're listening to the Kniep and It Real Jodcast. This is your host, Seth Kniep. Welcome back to the Jogcast, everybody. This is Seth Kniep, Kniep and It Real. Today, I'm going to give you seven principles that I find foundational to living with courage. Principle number one, do not believe everything that is trending. I remember one day when my children, back when they were in elementary school, one of them came home and they made this comment they learned from another kid. And I, th- I said it was, I thought it was so good. They said, what is trending is not always right. And what is right is not always right trending. This could never be true than when you look at social media today and mainstream media. This is why I believe someone should be very selective on what they listen to. Keep in mind, the majority of mainstream media channels are looking for the most sensational, negative, hair bristling content they can find. And they know that that's interesting. If you hear that someone died, you're likely to click on it to find out what happened. If you heard that a child was kidnapped, there's a lot of click desire there to find out what happened because it's sensational. But with that comes the temptation to bring toxic negativity in one's life. And the mainstream media is like having a really negative friend. I mean, if you have a friend and they're negative all the time, what's it gonna do to you after a while? You will start thinking, talking, and acting like them, and that is not going to help you live a courageous life. I just got back from Midwest Ecom. Midwest Ecom is an Amazon seller conference run by Travis Barrett. Fantastic conference. I got, when I was there, I spoke on how to build an Amazon business. But the really interesting part is when I had a conversation the night before at the meet and greet with this guy who works for Amazon's DSP, one of their delivery service providers. So if you order a product at Amazon, And that van that says Amazon on it drops the product off at your front door. He worked for one of those delivery service providers in downtown Seattle, Washington. I asked him, I said, you know how on the news it's been really trendy lately to say that Amazon makes their employees pee in bottles? He started laughing. He's like, yep. I said, I have to ask you, do they make you pee in bottles? And he just would not stop laughing. He's like, Seth, that is so ridiculous. I said, well, help me explain. Where did it come from? Didn't someone take a picture of a bottle with pee in it and post it online? He said, yes. He said, the difference is, Seth, a couple things that people don't understand. Number one, it is very common for delivery people to pee in bottles. This is not something unique to Amazon. This is not something unique to any delivery company. A lot of delivery people pee in bottles. And I said, so Amazon makes them. He said, no, they don't make us. They don't say anything about that. I said, then why do you do it? He said, well, you have to understand how the route works when you are delivering packages. If you are late on a delivery, then what happens is your delivery route is changed, which means you're now going to be going to different houses, different neighborhoods, different areas that you're not used to. And the way a delivery person is effective is they get to know the route really well. They know exactly where to turn, where to park, where not to, why the address isn't showing, where to drop off the mail, all those details. What happens at the beginning of the day, you're given like 130 some different packages you have to deliver. And if you don't keep on track, your route changes to a different one. And that creates an issue. So you have to go fast. And sometimes if you're stuck in traffic, you may not have time to get to the next place. And so a lot of delivery service people pee in bottles as a result. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because one person posts a picture of pee in a bottle who is a delivery, works for a delivery service provider. They're not even an employee of an Amazon. They're a contractor. So they work for a company and that company is a shipping company that works for Amazon. And it all of a sudden becomes trendy to say, Amazon makes their employees pee in bottles. See how that little twist they make and they say it's their employee when it's not, that little twist completely changes it. 
And then you have thousands, tens of thousands of people emotionally angry and upset. Oh, Amazon's evil and it must be Jeff Bezos fault because he's a psychopath. <laughs> If all they had done is just looked at the facts, there would not be this negative, toxic feeling in their heart. And they walk around with this toxic negativity. It's become so easy today to take one thing, twist it just a little bit, and then just push it online and believe it. And people, a lot of people are gullible. They just believe what they hear. And a lot of people, when they hear something, if it emotionally upsets them, they just believe it versus going and checking the facts. Now, I don't think any of us are completely impervious to this. I mean, you hear something, it upsets you. You might believe it because you're mostly engaged. This is why you have to be careful what you listen to because it will literally impact how you treat your spouse, how you treat your kids, how you treat your boyfriend and girlfriend, how you look at life, how you view people. The moment we start just having this toxic negativity towards people because of something we heard online and we don't even know if it's true is the moment we start to destroy our own lives. We start losing our purpose. Our purpose on earth was not to sit here and blast things on social media. It was to create, to build, to grow, to forgive, to love, to serve, to receive, to rejoice, to celebrate. Those are the things we're supposed to be living for, not online wars over something that was completely taken out of context. James O'Keefe interviewed a CNN reporter who openly admitted that their job is to use fear so that they can deliver the narrative that they want you to believe. The way it works is they first cut you open with the knife of fear. Then when you are the most vulnerable, they slip into your bloodstream the message they want you to believe. Now, this isn't just unique to CNN. There's a lot of media companies that do this. You have to understand there are so many, there's so much twisting of the truth so they can get you to click, so they can make money and get you to subscribe, leveraging fear, messing up your perspective on life so they can make money. And when you understand that, you start being selective. You start realizing, wait a minute, I just read that headline and it was a complete lie. And then I read the article and it debunked the headline and it wasn't negative at all. What do most people do? They just read the headlines. You see what I mean? So again, do not believe everything that is trending. Number two, know the facts before you make assumptions. Now, I'm not even talking about the news now. I'm talking about in your work relationship. We employ 33 staff. If you include all of our teams under subcontractors, it's like over, it's close to 70 people. The number one thing we find employees tend to make unless they are taught otherwise is to assume. You never want to assume. Always check the facts first. And this doesn't just apply to other people you work around. It applies to your mind. Do you ever have a day, I've done this so many times, where you get this idea about someone or something or the future and it's negative and it starts to grow on you and you don't even realize you're doing it. And over time, you start believing it. You know what I found helps? Try this. When you have fears and worries, just say them out loud. It will show you how ridiculous they sound. Just start saying, I'm afraid that this person's going to do this. Like, that doesn't sound like them at all. I'm afraid that blah, blah, that doesn't make sense. And all of a sudden you start to nip it in the bud and the fear goes away. And that brings me to my third point, which is choose failure over regret. Some people are so afraid that they never do anything with a hint of risk. It's a horrible way to live. But if you fail at the least, you get to learn something from it and your courage grew because you took the chance, you took the risk. But the problem with regret is in most situations, you can't fix it, you can't mend it because regret means, oh man, I wish I had, but I can't anymore. Now my child grew up and I no longer have an opportunity to build margin in my life so that I can spend time with them. Now I'm already 72 and I wish I had eaten healthier and now it's impacting my health and my cardiovascular system. Man, I wish I had spent more time with my spouse because maybe my marriage will be in a much better place today. And it doesn't mean you can't do something now, but regret always looks to the past and it's a, I wish I would have, I could have, why didn't I? That's much worse than taking a risk, a calculated risk, doing something and completely blowing it up and messing up. And you're like, wow, 
that really didn't go over as I expected, but here's what I learned. Here's how my courage grew. And I'm going to go at it again because now I know better how to do it the next time. You know, I'll never forget talking to this guy who, it was one of our interview guests, I believe. And he was sharing how this guy had nine products he launched on Amazon, nine, and all of them failed. His first nine products failed. I wonder how many people would have kept going after failure number one. How about after failure number four, number six? I mean, this guy's faith and resilience is incredible. No wonder he's a millionaire today. Now today he's successful. He looked at every failure as a learning lesson. And that brings me to number four. Don't try to please people, love people. It is sad to me when I see people online apologizing for things they did out of fear, not out of love out of fear of being branded a certain way, out of fear of being, oh yeah, you're this kind of person because something you did when you were 13 years old and drunk. Like it's, it's ridiculous. And what the sad part to me is not just the fact the way people try to drag up people's past to, to brand them, to label them as if you're forever an evil person because you did something stupid. I'm sure all the people accusing them of doing these things never did something stupid in their life. <laughs> but the worst part is when the person comes forward and says, Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been so wrong. And they're like profusely apologizing. And you're starting to think, are you doing this because you really actually care about what you did was wrong? Or are you doing it because you're afraid of how you will be perceived by the social media, social justice warriors sitting behind their computers and laptops and cell phones and their underwear at home blasting people? Like, what's the real motive there? And this is actually true, not just when it comes to your relationship with online world, but people in your personal life. It especially applies to marriage. If you're trying to just please your spouse, that's often not love. Because what it does is it enslaves you to them. And being enslaved to someone is not love. But when you love them, you do what's right, whether or not they agree. You do what is in the best interest of them, whether or not in the moment, they always like it. What do you mean, Seth? Well, has there ever been a time where someone you cared about, you needed to confront them about something because they hurt you and you did it respectfully, but you need not talking to them is not loving them. It's just avoiding an uncomfortable situation to make oneself feel better. But if you actually talk to them and say, look, I need you to know something. This was hurtful and here's why. It may not be comfortable. You may not be pleasing them in the moment but you're doing the right thing. And doing the right thing always creates long-term stability. Look at it this way. Short-term disability creates long-term stability. You do what is right even when it's difficult. And even though it hurts in the moment, you reap what you sow. The fruit will come later. Look, when you're digging the hole in the ground to plant the tree and you're laboring in the sun to water the tree and fertilize the tree, don't expect apples on the fruit tree yet. It might take a few years, but see, that's the difference between trying to live to please people to get their approval versus loving them. And that's where people actually have a conscience and conviction and they'll respect you. You don't just do it because, oh, someone's going to like it. You do it because you are convicted about it and you know it is the right thing. In fact, people who struggle with trying to control everyone are actually trying to please people. It's in reverse. What they're doing is they're trying to create an environment that they have the way they want. So people will think better of them. But you see, when you love people, you realize you can't control anyone, but you can influence them. And there's no influence powerful, more powerful than love on planet earth. Love conquers all. I'll never forget on, I forget which newscast it was, but way back when the whole thing with George Floyd happened, there was this guy, this African-American black guy walking around and he's hugging people. And this news company tried to interview him and they were trying to get him riled up and upset. And he's like, and they're like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm hugging people. I'm like, oh, how do you feel about this? He says, people need to be loved. Love is a solution. You love people, you care for people. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, we're not creating all the segregation between black and white people or Chinese and white people or white and black. All of a sudden, it starts to break down these barriers and the lies that happen so often. All of a sudden, you just start treating people out of love. And people hate hearing this because they want something to get angry about. But how would you like to live your life? Do you want to live your life in a way that is fulfilling and rewarding and lets you grow and allows you to do things you couldn't otherwise? Or do you want to live it constantly in fear and hate and anger? Live to love people. 
care for people. They're individuals. Treat them as such. And it doesn't mean you always agree with them. One of the biggest mistakes I made in my marriage was trying to please my wife. Yeah, that sounds ridiculous, Seth. Of course it does. But that was codependency. It wasn't out of love. It was so I could get what I wanted. That's manipulation. Oh, make sure she's happy so we get along and I feel good. You know, I hate the phrase, happy wife, happy life. I think it's a stupid phrase. I just do. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, so you're tr living to try to make sure she's happy and she controls the happiness of the home? That's not healthy. That's like a, that's like a tyrant. No, no, no wife or husband should control the happiness of the home. They should focus on loving each other, not trying to make each other happy. Because when you love someone, it means you will have sometimes have to fight things out. You'll have conflict. But through that conflict, you learn grace, you learn forgiveness, you learn humility. And all of a sudden, that is a real relationship that has deep roots and that grows like a tree. Number five, quit second guessing yourself. Stop second guessing yourself. I see this so often. I've seen it in my life a lot. I do it less than I used to, where you know you need to do something. You're excited. You want to launch that product on Amazon. You want to go talk to this person because you're attracted to them and maybe you can take them on a date. You want to go vegan because you know it's better for your body. Whatever it is, you want to start hitting the gym. You want to start saving money. You want to take maybe Dave Ramsey's financial piece, whatever it is, and you stop like, wait, am I sure I want to do this? Hold on, what happened to you a few minutes before? Why did you decide this is a good thing to do? Because it was healthy, because it would change your life, because you were thinking about your future self, not just immediate gratification. Stop second guessing yourself. When I am unsure about which path to take and I stand at a crossroads and I'm like, okay, I don't know which way to go because my mind's messing with me or emotions are getting in the way or maybe someone said, this person said this and this change and, and all of a sudden you have these fears going on. What I do is I go back, what was the last thing I knew for sure was the right decision and I go back to that and then I act on it. Even though your feelings might be over here, you act over here, those feelings, they catch up later on. It's kind of cool because this now gets into your relationship with yourself. You're influencing yourself. You are motivating yourself to change. And there's power in that. Number six, ask for forgiveness when you wrong someone. Someone's gonna say, Seth, how in the world does this have anything to do with living with outrageous courage? Because people who have the confidence and the emotional and moral security within themselves to admit when they wrong someone and to do it humbly are the people who have the most courage on planet earth. They're not living in fear. They're not living off of triggers. They're living out of security because in their soul, in their heart, they're forgiven, they're loved, they feel good. Doesn't mean you don't have bad days, but at your core value, you are who you are no matter what the world says, what the world does, nothing can change that. The funny thing is, this is why I love history. If you go back in history, you see these, these floods of change. Like for a while, everyone's upset about this. And then the hundred years later, everyone's upset about this. And it's always the thing in the moment. If you lived in the 1940s, and I'm no way am I condoning Nazism when I say this, but that was the big topic. Well, you don't hear about that much today. Now you hear about other topics. I'm not saying they don't matter. My point is it gives you perspective. You don't want your life to be so caught up into what's trending at the moment that it controls you. And now you're living in fear and you're afraid of coming off a certain way because someone's gonna blast you. Even though they don't know you, they don't care about you, they didn't live with you, they didn't walk with you, they didn't see you when you grew up, they know nothing about you. But because you said one thing just the wrong way, blah, 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 let me get them. You see what I mean? It's sad. Now, how does this relate to asking for forgiveness? Well, when you have the ability, when you know you've done something wrong, you said something wrong, and you walk up to the person and you, you don't say, I'm sorry. Sorry is kind of pathetic. In my opinion, it's a pathetic excuse for taking ownership. Say this, John, whoever it was you offended, will you please forgive me? What I said was rude and it was hurtful to you. And I'm really sorry about that. You see the difference between that and say, hey, I'm sorry if that hurt you. That's almost condescending. Like if it hurt you, it doesn't mean I did anything wrong. If it hurt you, if you felt bad because you have your issues, I'm sorry about that. See the difference? No, instead, Susan, Lucy, whoever, Mary, please forgive me. You know what's funny? It, in most situations, unless they have a lot of issues, it just completely melts all anger, all hate, all resentment. And it takes them by surprise. And a lot of people, they try to backpedal like, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Oh, come on. It's a, and you're like, no, you know it was a big deal because they were pissed. <laughs> I got to tell you a quick story. 
I'm at Midwest Ecom and I'm sitting next to this guy who is a software developer, really smart guy. And he's interested in helping us with Niche Hunter, our software program that helps Amazon sellers find products. You can go there, you can sign up if you wanna be on the waiting list. It's jod.com slash nh, jod.com slash nh. It is it, it's an Amazon tool built by Amazon sellers for Amazon sellers. And so he and I decided I would call my business partner so they could talk. So we walked outside and I put him on speakerphone and we had a quick conference call. Myself, the new software engineer I met, and my business partner who lives, who wasn't there in Minneapolis with us at the time. And when the software developer asked what code we're using, and our guy said PHP, the software engineer said, he started laughing. He goes, are we still in the 90s? And then towards the end of the conversation, I asked my business partner, I said, do you have any more questions that you wanna ask him? And my business partner said, yeah. I really don't want to work with someone who makes fun of them because they're using a particular code. And when I got off the phone, I looked to the engineer and the engineer goes, I really pissed him off, didn't I? I said, yeah, you did. What you said was rude. You could have handled that different. He's like, man, I am so sorry. I said, well, I think you need to talk to him directly and just be upfront about it. The sincerity in his voice, the way he responded, the way he handled that offense and showing regret, a regret because he might blow a business opportunity. I get it. But the fact that he was humble about it, he didn't brush it off. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry if it hurt you. No, he's like, I'm really sorry. It was like saying, please forgive me. And guys, I'm not saying the words are magical by saying, please forgive me, but it's more about the sincerity. If I say, will you please forgive me? It's, I'm saying, I owe you something. I hurt you. I took something from you. Will you forgive me of that? Will you remove my duty? Like, will you, will you show me grace? It's a request, it's a humble request. There is so much power in that. There is no marriage, no relationship I've ever seen that lasts if both parties are not willing to forgive. Because guess what? It's not if you're going to hurt each other, it's when you're gonna hurt each other. Showing grace and forgiveness is so key. And I'll tell you, people who struggle to take ownership and ask forgiveness are people who probably judge themselves a lot. They walk around judging people a lot because they judge themselves so harshly. And they're afraid to say, please forgive me. Something in them, maybe from their childhood, thinks that things are gonna go bad. No, it won't. You will find freedom when you ask forgiveness, when you wrong someone, it will grow your courage. One more thing I wanna share, and this is number seven. Do one thing at a time and obsess about it. This creates courage. If you live a life where you're easily distracted and you do one thing, and then you get distracted doing the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, and you get to the end of your day and you've got nothing done, or you just did a lot of stuff, you were busy, but you didn't accomplish what you really want to do. It will decrease your courage. It will work like bacteria, like a virus on your courage. And over time, you'll start having less courage about reaching your goals, less courage that you can get to where you want to be. And you'll start doubting yourself a lot because you're not getting anywhere. You wanna be passionate about life. You want energy for life, then do. Do your goals. Focus on one thing, the most important thing, at a time and obsess about it and do it with all your heart. Even if you're working for someone and it's not your favorite thing to do, still do it with all your heart. Do it with excellence. You will find yourself a happier, more fulfilled person. It is okay to be sad some days. It is okay some days to feel discouraged. It is okay to feel stuck. It is okay sometimes to feel hopeless, but remember this, you will not stop. You will keep going. I'm praying for you. I'm rooting for you. I believe in you. Let's do this.